Kirsty. So hi, I'm Monica McGeek. Um, I am the very recently finished first five lead for West of Scotland. Um, so thank you all very much for coming tonight to our Top Tips in 10 night. So this is part of the National First Five series, so and it was West of Scotland's turn to host um, this year. So, um, so thank you all very much for, for coming. So tonight we've got two speakers. Um, we've got Kieran Dunwoody who's going to speak first and covering three topics, which is impossible to cover in 10 minutes, but covering uh, dermatology. Then we'll have um, dermatology, chronic pain and also geriatric medicine. And in between each talk, we'll have five minutes for questions. Um, so feel free, yes, Christine can at that point put your hand up. We can also in the chat bar as well, if you wish as well, but probably ideally hand up because there's a bit more of a discussion and interaction because um, that's always the best. Thing about these events is actually getting to speak about and ask about the questions you're kind of always burning to ask. Uh, and then we've also got Shan Ashby who's also going to speak to us about sustainability as well. So thank you both very much to both of them for coming along tonight. Um, and in case I forget to Kirsty um, and also to Gillian for helping to organise tonight as well. Um, as I say, so I'm the, the kind of recently finished first five lead because I'm no longer first five sadly uh, CCT'd five years ago in August so um, that I'm no longer that lead I'm now too old and sadly um, so I've now handed over to Ishmael and uh, Gorkum and um, so they're the two coolies that are now come in and taken over from my place um, but just I'll go and put in the chat bar our current contact information again just to make sure you know how to um, contact us through social media so we've got Facebook page Twitter page and email address and we've also very recently got a, a very informal kind of social first five WhatsApp group for West of Scotland. So if anybody in the area or even out with the area and just wants to kind of keep in touch with the early careers in West of Scotland, then feel free to send us a message on, um, through social media or email and we can add you to the group if you wish. There's not too many memes, I promise you. Um, it's just helpful chat and keeping in touch. Um, we've had one social night so far and another one planned for January. So yeah, feel free to get in touch. So thank you all again for coming um, and I'll hand you over to Kieran. Thanks, Kieran. Thanks, Monica. Um, thanks, Kirsty. Thanks everyone for being here. I'll just get my, my screen up. Everyone see that? Yes, can thanks. Okay, um, I just heard what you said, Monica. If you're the end of first five, that makes me somewhere in the middle of middle twenty, I think. Uh, so, yeah, it's not that long ago that I qualified, um, but yeah, I feel like the senior citizen now, so that's cool. Um, Thanks everyone for the evening and it is a crazy idea to do three clinical subjects in 10 minutes but why not let's have fun and I think that the goal here is that you guys know this stuff and um, my hope is to give tools that you already have and maybe use them in a different way and uh, and maybe introduce a few new tools and and I'm trying to make this as useful as possible because the job is not easy at the moment and the goal is to make things easier for you uh, so let's crack into it. Every second I speak, I think like, it's like grains of sand falling at the timer. Um, the overview is that it's about what matters to you, um, and we're going to have a wee kind of a thing that's going to be a way of doing that. And then it's practical dermatology, then five minutes of Q&A, and then Monica's got the timer, uh, and she'll let us know when we're beyond. And then it's painkillers to pain management, and then geriatrics with a twist as well. And just a little bit about my own background, um, I did four months in dermatology and then started the GP in the practice as a trainee and then everyone told the patients I was the specialist and I felt I had massive imposter syndrome so I went off and got a diploma and then we did a bit of a textbook chapter in it um, so I, I'm still kind of learning as I go along but um, trying to be a bit more better at it and, uh, and the painkillers to pain management for the last two years I've worked as the national GP advisor for chronic pain so hopefully I can give some tips and tricks for that and geriatrics with a twist uh, we covered four care homes so again a sense of discomfort of not knowing it well enough so did the diploma and hoping to use that with the kind of realistic medicine themes that's my own background a bit so what matters to you so imagine 
if you've got a pen and paper in front of you, I want you to get a blank bit of paper just now and do three columns and do dermatology at the top, chronic pain, and then geriatrics. And now what I want you to do is imagine your surgery from hell. Imagine it's Monday morning and you look at your list and you're like, oh no, and you've got a wee line of what the problem is or who the person is or whatever. And I'm just going to time it for one minute um, for you to write down the conditions and those theories that cause you most discomfort. And that's just coming up for a minute. That's your appraisal sorted. See you later. Bye. Bye. Right. So we're going to go into it now. Uh, hopefully, if this covers it in the talk, it's great. And if not, we'll try to do a QA of the links. So practical dermatology. Let's let's dance. Um, this is the first sheet. I've already done it. Um, so we did a webinar last year. Um, it's free and it's on the University of Glasgow and it's an hour and a half, and it's got um medical dermatology, surgical dermatology, and weird dermatology, and it's got Q&A at all points. So if you want to get yourself a free webinar that we did last year that's on the University of Glasgow webpage, that's available and it goes through all the pictures and things like that and, and does it much more comprehensively than what I'm going to do now. Um, I think the thing with dermatology is uh, that it's usually horses but remember zebras. And I think the thing that people get worried about is the differentials. What could this be? It's a weird rash. Um, and I think this is a beautiful picture on the right. You see the, the, the kind of horses, but then you, you look closer and you can see it's a shadow of a horse and it's actually a zebra. So there is this thing in dermatology about differentials. And I think the, 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 one of the, the key things is, I would say, is avoid starting with a rash when someone comes to see you. You know, check their notes before coming in. You know, is this a high risk or low risk patient? Have they had a history of cancer before or not? Are they very immunosuppressed or something like that? Just to get a wee feel for them. Um, and when they, they're giving you the history, just I suppose they will always have that instant instinct to rush into the rash, but just to hold back a bit and check the notes and ask some questions for the history. And, and that can reduce cognitive biases. The question I ask myself is, what's the most common thing this could be and what's the worst thing it could be? Um, and and then if I'm, I try and treat the most common thing and then safety net the worst thing it could be. And the other thing I, I do really is just this idea of three strikes. So if, if someone comes to times um, with their rash, it's not getting better, it's getting worse, and I've tried three different things, that's the point where I'm going to say, well, I'm going to get a second opinion here or I might do a referral. The top tips I'd say uh, around about is, again, check the notes and take a focused his focus history. Common things are common. It's more likely to be a typical eczema than it is some weird and wonderful thing or a typical uh, fungal infection. So make sure you're kind of treating the common things and your differential. Um, if something, the rash is unilateral, then it's likely to be exogenous. So something like a fungal uh, infection. And if it's symmetrical, it's likely to be endogenous as well. So you're kind of like atopic eczema and things like that. Um, but it's quite a nice tip if something's unilateral thing, it's probably an external source. Uh, rashes are often variants of eczema, fungal infections, or psoriasis, especially if they're dry and scaly, and to try and really make sure that those things are managed uh, as part of the differential. Um, and, you know, we've all done, I've, I've done it, I've sent off the weird and wonderful rash to the dermatology, and I get back, it's, it's psoriasis, and I think, oh, right, okay. Um, another thing to say is that differentials, uh, sometimes just for drugs, bugs, and systemic illnesses. So have they started a new medicine fairly recently, um, an opioid with itch, NSA, beta blocker with some rashes? Um, is, there, is there an infestation maybe? Is, is again, is there some bugs? Or again, is there systemic illness? Have they got other signs? Um, bilateral egg cellulitis is rare, 
Um, so it's classically an older person, it's classically in the summer, it's classically a nursing home resident, they've got bilateral cellulitis, can we get an antibiotic? Um, what I do, uh, we, we cover care homes, as I say to them, please raise your legs up, Mark, uh, and phone me back in two hours if it's spreading, but it should be getting better at that point, because a lot of times there's venous hypertension and varicose eczema, and that's what causes the redness and things, and you get that through that kind of all the way through to a lipodermatosclerosis and things and leg ulcers, but giving people education and, and tools uh, gets them off the merry-go-round of asking for drugs and things. Um, steroids, if you give someone a steroid and the rash gets worse, the three common conditions are rosacea, perioral dermatitis and tinea. Um, so that's a good tip if, if somebody had been to see another doctor but the rash is worse and they come to you and they think, oh, that person gave them hydrocortisone or Umivate. Those are quite common things that can easily get misdiagnosed, but the, the trick is that the steroid makes it worse. Uh, flares uh, are driven by stress or lack of self-management. So a, a big part of derm uh, dermatology is chronic conditions like eczema and psoriasis. And if somebody's flaring a lot, think of it being almost like a manifestation of stress or that they've just never had a good understanding of it being a long-term condition and how to manage it and see it through that kind of long-term condition framework. Um, and we'll give resources for that. Uh, a really cool tool is the DLQI, Dermatology Life Quality Index. And um, I think when I spoke to a dermatologist before, I said, who do you not see that you want to see? And he said, people that are really struggling with rashes. And we might be saying, oh, that's just eczema, it's okay. But if the person's come back and their DLQI is out of 30, it's 15, 20, maybe they're not socialising, maybe they're not you know, being able to live their life, it's taking over their life, eh, even though it's not a, a sinister thing. So if there's high suffering despite our attempts to manage it, then it, that's very, very justified to refer that one to dermatology if we've tried our best. So it's a good indication of how much something's affecting someone. And equally, if somebody's really saying it's really bad and they do a DLKI and it's five out of 30, you think, well, it's not that bad. So it's quite useful. Surgical dermatology, I'm sure people are familiar with this. It's the ABCDE. Um, we are familiar with it um, in terms of what's normal and what's not, but patients aren't familiar with it. And this is a very good tool to manage risk. So we see someone, they've got a, a skin what, lump or a mole, it's a bit different, but we are satisfied, but they are, we've got that kind of in our, oh, do I refer it or do I not? So the thing I do is I, I have this picture up with them. I go through it, I say that it doesn't meet the criteria, um, but they should take a photograph of it with the measurement. And I've measured it there that day and they should repeat the photograph again in six weeks. Um, and if the person does that, it's a way of them uh, safety netting themselves as well, and they can keep an eye and they know what to look for, especially the most important one for me is the e-evolving as well. So it gives them a bit of a toolkit to manage their own things, and especially if they you know, go on a summer holiday and something's a bit darker than usual, like a freckle, they can do that and monitor it, and it just helps with the health anxiety as well, and it's a kind of pragmatic way of managing it. So red flags, think, th things that come to mind are, I ask myself, is this a high-risk patient or a high-risk symptom? Um, and high-risk symptoms, something's rapidly growing or changing. The ABCDE is excellent. And rashes shouldn't be painful or burning. I've just finished on call at six and at half five, somebody came to me in distress. And I, it could have been anything that was so sore. Um, but it went from being a UTI to an abdo pain to pneumonia to actually just felt her skin and she had allodynia and neuropathic pain in her shoulder and she's probably going to develop shingles. So um, if something's burning, think about a uh, herpes um, or, or underlying if it's chronic inflammation or even SLE. Um, if pathology, if somebody's got progressive symptoms like weight loss and malaise, weight loss and malaise as well, so systemic. And hair and, hair and, uh, na hair and nails are quite good for manifestations of skin disorders to look at that as well. Um, if something's not getting better, a rash, then think of immunosuppression and the common one being diabetes, but obviously other ones as well, such as HIV. And immunocompromised patients do get, do get more kind of warts and high risk of SCC as well. If you get an older person, uh, more likely to be sinister if they've got dry skin, or very, very dry skin um, or pruritus that's kind of disabling, so it's good to check bloods. And if they've got nail changes, uh, Hutchison signs, very sensible to check for, which is proximal uh, kind of spread beyond the nail bed as well. And that's a red flag. Resources, there are many. The one that I think is excellent, when I did this talk last year and a lot of people didn't know about it, is the Dermatology Patient Pathways. This is by the Scottish Dermatology Consultants. And it's got all the pathways for managing patients. And it's got 
tips and tricks on it as well. And, uh, and it's really, really good. And it's an app and it's a website as well. So if you're not sure what, I, what prescription do I do such and such, just go on Dermatology Patient Pathways. And it's got loads of conditions covered. Uh, if there's National Eczema uh, Helpline is uh, really good as well, National Eczema Society. So, you know, the patient's already had two or three problems. We don't have time to give them the Perception, but give them the a National Eczema Society website as well because that's actually a counselling phone number. So especially for people with children that want more time to go through it and can get counselled, so that's uh, helpful. The Primary Care Dermatology Society is one page summaries um, and Dermnet is excellent kind of pictures and British Association of Dermatology has leaflets. Local dermatologists as well, maybe shadowing opportunities and obviously Facebook groups as well. So that's me wrapped through the first one. I hope you're still there. Series of black screens. I see Monica smiling. Um, so uh, over to you guys now. Great, thanks, Karen. So if people, that was very helpful. And I already, I'm scribbling down lots of very helpful practical tips um, and loads of good resources I hadn't heard of as well. So very helpful, thanks. Um, so if people want to put their hands up any questions or I see you can put in the chat bar, probably easier putting the hand up. No, well, no, because I know that when you said about writing down things, yeah, the things I put down was red rashes and moles. Um, so you covered exactly kind of what I was uh, hoping you would have covered. Um, so you've yeah, got a couple of questions. Um, Fizz is asking, is it possible to be a GP with special interest in dermatology? Yes. How you go about that, yeah. Yes, uh, just send an email to your local dermatology department and I'm sure they'll bite the hand off you. Um, so uh, absolutely, I think the, the diploma is good. Um, so I did it in Glasgow, but the Glasgow one is no longer up and running. There's the Cardiff diploma uh, that gets a very good reputation. Um, and there's, I think, I think enthusiasm and you know, it just reaching out to people and, and, and consultant colleagues are, are very open and willing to say, right, this is what we're looking for. This is how we can help you. So yeah, if somebody's got an interest, absolutely. Good, thanks. And I think um, Prish is asking, well, thanks for this. Um, six weeks, is that kind of enough time for things to evolve? So I think referring back to the, the mole, you would get the patients yes, to yeah. safe and everything. It's a good question. Um, I think that the I think the principle is evolving um, so that the person knows what to look for because they'll be keeping an eye on it. I think the reason you say six weeks is probably if they look at it every day, it's like a kettle watch never boils. So you're trying to give a, a period of time that's sensible as well. Um, if, if you want to extend it, the person can keep an eye on it as well. So it's general that that general sort of signpost and advice of this is what you can look for. You've monitored it. You can check it again in a period of time. Um, but I've not had any adverse outcomes from that approach. And it's not to say, if, I mean, if you think it's suspicious, then absolutely we should refer. But it's more like the ones that we think aren't suspicious, um, but we want a safety net on top of it. Uh, does that, I can't quite see the chat, but does that answer the question or not? Yeah, uh, it was, is six weeks enough time for things to evolve? So things evolve and you're thinking about melanoma. That's the one that comes to mind. Um, but a BCC will evolve in six weeks as well, and an SCC will evolve in six weeks. So those are the three, uh, you know, the three sinister ones that come to mind. Good, thank you. And you have quite like the practical step, just even with the bilateral leg cellulitis for the care home, actually like raise legs and call me back in two hours because you're right, actually that would that would resolve. Um, I think I've tried the getting them to do it whilst like you know a couple of minutes, but actually yeah. Sure, is much more practical. Gives you a chance as well to do other things, and they can call you back if you're still interested. And all very practical advice. Thank you. Any more questions? Don't see any more hands up. So no. Thanks very much, Karen. That was good. Very good coverage of dermatology. I'll let you go into your next one. I'm just going to try and fix this. Yeah, no problem. And I'm also I'm sure if people have questions that crop up related to dermatology later on, they can ask again. They don't have to feel like they've missed an opportunity. So feel free to ask if you think of something else later on. Yeah. 
The one thing I didn't cover in the dermatology talk, but it is in the main talk, and there's some really nice pictures, is pink things scare dermatologists. So if you've got a pink lesion that's changing, that's the one to have a super low threshold for, because the one they're really scared of is amelanotic melanoma, um, and it does get missed. Um, but again, there's some in the main talk, there's some really nice pictures there. Okay, so we're going on to the next one. And as I said, I'm very happy to be contacted. If anyone you know, wants specific questions about chronic pain or any of this, happy to be contacted um, as well. So what is chronic pain? I mean, it's, it's something I was taught nothing about at uni, nothing about at my GP training, nothing about um, until I experienced people with chronic pain. So the, I got into it because I, I didn't know what it was really. And I knew I was, whatever I was doing, I was doing it poorly. Um, so the first principle is that chronic pain is a pain that persists uh, for more than three months. That's the first thing beyond tissue healing time. And I would probably add to that in the absence of red flags. So someone might have back pain for six years, but if they've got three weeks of uh, fecal and urinary incontinence, then you're back into the red flag territory again. So I think that's where the, the value of, you know, being a generalist comes in very strongly. You wouldn't exclude red flags on that, something that's progressive versus something that's been there quite static for a long time. So the first principle is long-term, uh, no sinister changes. And then the second thing that is really helpful in your definition is that it's a pleasant sensory, but also emotional experience. And we've all been there. We've all had the person crying their eyes out and transferring a lot of emotion onto us. Um, and that's the emotional component of pain. And actually seeing it through that lens gives us a lot more tools as well to manage it. We can see it as part of a mental health process as well and the value of antidepressants with that. So really, we're kind of uh, coming up to a paradigm shift, a fork in the road. And if you could remember anything from this talk, it's um, we're moving away from treating it as a symptom that needs a tablet to treating it as a, it's a long-term condition that needs a team. And uh, just like if somebody had diabetes, we wouldn't say there's a tablet off you go. We would say, what's your understanding of it? How can we support you and build a plan? And then safe, effective medicines as well. Um, and really at the core of this is moving away from cure seeking to acceptance with support. But what chance do the patients have if we are not there? So we have to be there for the patients singing from the same hymn sheet so that they've got a chance to engage in that because there's so little public knowledge about chronic pain being a long-term condition. There are guidelines for this. They're signed 2019 and NICE 2021. And I've separated it because we all think about the drugs, but better to start off with the assessment and management. Um, so the first thing is a holistic approach. Um, so instead of the where's it sore, how's it sore, that kind of biomedical, actually moving on from that as well and saying, well, how's it affecting your life? And what do you think it is? And what are you worried about? What are you hoping for? So almost like doing the ice, but doing the ice. The person, that's like the person you want to do the ice the least with is almost like the person you need to do it the most with. And, um, and then having that, finding out what the patient's pain story is, just being really honest and saying, look, this is a long-term condition, we can't cure it. You know, it's about managing it so it doesn't manage you. And then working with them for that. And then actually asking, well, what matters to you? What do you want for yourself in your life? And often people say, stay at work, child care, being a carer, retaining their independence, and then building in the more psychological and physical approaches that will come to. And again, you'll hear me say the words education and support a lot. People need information, but they need people to help them learn as well often. So it often needs an MDT approach. With medicines, um, the key principle is safe, effective prescribing. So keep it simple and do no harm. Um, and th there's increasing awareness of the harms uh, of opioids and gabapentinoids as well. And probably we're in an age now of rationalising medicines. The patients are already on all the tablets. Um, and you want to rationalise them and, and prescribe effectively and even deprescribe uh, to, to clean it up as well. Uh, the, the things that I say to people are that medicines, if they work, uh, you're only going to get about a 30% impact. And the goal is to improve their function, not reduce their pain. Uh, and, you know, a lot of medicines, they don't work and a lot of medicines cause harm. So I see it through that lens of actually this is, uh, instead of fire and forget prescribing, putting on repeat, almost like a drug trial. Um, so it's like try before you buy in a way and if it works and it improves function great but if it doesn't there's no point in taking it so to get that upfront agreement with the patient so that they're uh, they're more informed at the start uh, there's awareness in as well in neuropathic pain so neuropathic pain medicines are more effective and to think about that uh, when screening for pain and the value of antidepressants especially with comorbid sort of uh, mental health problems 
Dr. Tim Williams uh, is a GP with special interest in chronic pain. He, he does an excellent video um, with Live Well With Pain. And this is a video that taught me a lot. And I would say if to watch one video, it would be his video. And the link is here in the top, talk when you get a copy of it. And he goes through it and he effectively says, look, the goal is self-management and the confidence. This is a long-term condition, take your time. You know, it, it cannot be done in 10 minutes, so don't try. Um, the point in one is really to build the relationship. Uh, hear the person, and usually they've got three other problems as well. So build the relationship, you know, listen is probably the most important thing. And then uh, you can ask about, oh, how is it affecting your life? You can give some metaphors about pain or, or do a, maybe a neuropathic pain assessment, but then just signpost them to a website as well one that you find useful and then when they come back say look can I see you again we'll have a specific pain management appointment and especially if it's complex and on tons of medicines it's perfectly legitimate to give yourself 20 minutes for that appointment and I did that and it made a big difference because it took the pressure off me um, and in that appointment you're sort of they've gone to the website or camera they've not got three other problems and then you can actually have a, a meaningful conversation about this being a long-term condition and then you're into sort of safe prescribing territory and giving them the sort of upfront agreements with things and drug trials. A thing that saves a lot of time is the code hash 66N and that says review chronic pain and vision anemis and what that does is that if you do that and do that your kind of pain review it means that you don't need to go over the same territory again when they come back and it might be three months to come back but instead of starting from the start you actually say oh yeah we had that conversation and yeah, we did this. And did you manage that website? And what did you think of this? So it just helps to build relationships and it helps to save time. Um, so I know a lot of people are thinking that it's easy, but do you know my patient? And um, so uh, absolutely, these can be the most complex patients. So uh, we've got a video uh, that's free in uh, NES CPD Connect, and there'll be a link to this. And what it is, is that we use transactional analysis. Uh, so this idea of parent, adult, child, to see how to deal with the transference from patients' emotions. So it's a person, this is a professional actor, um, who's playing a patient of, with fibromyalgia, who's having a huge pain flare, is in distress and is drug seeking. And um, so that video is free and you can see how we do the pain consultation. And we do have an, a primary care pain consultation model now that's available. Um, and this is the model I use in our own practice as well. So hopefully it's kind of uh, helpful. There are resources, um, so education, NHS Inform, uh, is always getting stronger in um, third sector. So Versus Arthritis, that has a helpline for people uh, with arthritis and even fibromyalgia and, and chronic regional pain syndrome. So it covers all, so it's a nice helpline and they send things to the person's house as well. So it's good if they're not online. Pain Concern uh, has a helpline as well and has a very good website and Pain Association Scotland has groups. And Live Well with Pain has a really nice website. It's got patient facing part and a clinician facing part. So it's got really nice CPD things on it as well for metaphors and how to explain pain. Uh, psychological, so um, as NHS Inform has a guide, but Silver Cloud has a chronic pain CBT and mental health as well, if resources for that. And more and more, we get mental health ladies and nurses in the practice. Physical pacing, a uh, huge part of chronic pain. Not got much time to talk about it, but instead of hitting, it, hitting them all and boom and bust, people managing their energy and how to do that. And the, the websites talk about that and physical activity prescription often if people are isolated and alone and maybe that can give them an opportunity to increase things slowly. Social support, family, workplace, third sector as well. Those are useful resources. And then and after that, we're into medicines and the use of skilled practitioners in primary care. So now we've got pharmacists in our team, we've got other uh, workers as well, you know, other colleagues as well to use that wider team model. Specialists, uh, we've got pharmacists, so if somebody's on a ton of drugs and you don't get time to prescribe, uh, deprescribe, I don't blame you, but use your pharmacist as a colleague in this and do it as a team. So Pain Data is an excellent website and you can it actually shows you a graph on how to reduce opioids um, and all types of opioids. So it's 10% every one to two weeks. Um, GABA, it can even print off a plan for the person. Uh, gabapentin can be reduced by 300 milligrams a week. Pre-gabal uh, pre in itself, uh, 50 to 100 milligrams every one to two weeks. And this is a nice video from the pain team in Lanarkshire. And it's just three and a half minutes and explains what the pain team does. And it's really nice for patients to read that or watch that wee video before they get referred into a pain clinic wherever they are, because then they're more understanding when they arrive at the consultant and they get it instead of looking for a fix. So they want people to not have red flags or await other services. 
uh, the person has to accept it's a rehab service. So I think we can do a good job by giving the honest message to the patient before we do the referral so the person's understanding when they arrive. And then the person can take in information and if they can't, then bring someone that can. Um, and another indication for me is if somebody, despite all we've tried, if they keep coming, I'm up to five, six, seven reviews, I think it's time to refer to the pain team. There is evidence from a practice across Scotland now that have deprescribed hugely. Um, and you know, these are Scotland's top three prescribing practices and the link in talk will take you to the case studies. And these are the principles that they've said, first do no harm, you can look at your own practice data and reflect, change the practice culture from painkillers to pain management and do it as a team so you've got a consistent message. Uh, use your IT systems to make it easier. So uh, drug trials, uh, things like vision can do is force reauthorize minimum order times and a lot of EMIS practices put their analgesics on the acute so it's easier to kind of monitor it. And really working in partnership with patients as, I talk, as well, so that they're fully informed and in how to manage their condition and given information and support through uh, the, the skilled practitioners. Uh, pain team collaboration, um, pain teams are the nice people, reach out to them, uh, there's shadow opportunities, they, they can do education, they can give uh, build relationships and get support and all the practices said that this was a public health issue as well. These are the resources as well that links to them, it's a different questionnaire, DN4 is really useful uh, for if somebody's on opioids and gabapentinoids and you do that you can help effectively de-prescribe, see which type of pain they've got. And this is Pain Team Scotland. Um, so it's a Facebook group, you're all welcome to join. It's for NHS clinicians in Scotland across primary and secondary care. And you can see that we've got uh, 440 members just now. So there's resource sharing and clinical discussion and de-prescribing information. So that kind of, uh, if you've got a problem related to chronic pain, stick it in there, you'll get an answer. Um, and over to Monica. Okay, thank you very much again, Karen. Again, lots of very helpful practical tips because I think, you should, yeah, we're all aware that chronic pain, which is how do you start addressing it, but yeah, lots of just very helpful things that we can do within consultations. You say it's given actually patients a time, so having a double appointment or to have these discussions with patients and to talk them through it because you'll save, will be better for them in the long run and for you as well. So, um, so yeah, I think giving yourself that time. Um, so anybody got any questions again, probably either put your hand up um, or chat more if you wish. And I even think it's the language as well, because people, you know, talk about painkillers and I keep saying to patients, they're not, it's not going to kill the pain, it reduces it down. Um, it's almost like we need another word for painkillers. So yeah, I find that quite hard, just the I language just as well. Them call them pain tablets or analgesics, yes. I, I, I don't use that term anymore, absolutely. Yeah, because I think people, yeah, they just think, oh, that's, I've, I've, I'm taking those painkillers, but I'm still in pain. Yeah, because they're just reducing it down. Um, yeah, we've got a question from Doug. Hi, Doug. Hi, evening, that was, that was great. I was just wondering, um, is there any benefit in using kind of modified release or slow release opiates as opposed to the, the immediate release preparations more regularly during the day for patients? Thanks Doug, that's a great question. Um, so I think the answer is that um, it depends on the person's pain. I've seen different things written in different guidelines at different times. Um, so if someone, it's maybe better to explain the answer through a practical kind of case studies, but say somebody's got osteoarthritis and they just take two cocodamol before they walk the dog in the morning, then that's absolutely fine. To, you know, the cocodamol, the short acting route, or someone it takes it, maybe they've got a lot of pain at night before they go to bed and they take it then or so. Um, that's probably the highest value of the short acting if it's based on some of these activities. Um, and they're not into the sort of two or four times a day because then you just get addicted. Um, if they uh, are dependent with it, uh, or there's a close overlap, um, if somebody's in chronic pain all the time, 24-7, uh, then it doesn't make sense to use short-acting analgesics because that's not what they're designed for. And then, yes, you're into the long-acting analgesics. And I think that the principle with that is 
you would start off with the the best medicine is the one that's the most effective at the lowest dose. So you would start off with a low dose of a long-term morphine. Say, say you did do it like MST, but the, the agreement you would have, and this is what helps me so much, is to have baseline scores. So what's your pain out of 10? Eight. What's the impact in your life out of 10? Zero, you can do what you want. 10, you can hardly get out of your bed. Eight, right? It's really having a huge impact in your life. Okay, let's try a low dose of MST, five, five. And let's come back to me in about two to four weeks or something like that. And they come back in two to four weeks and they say, eh, that's great. Eh, it's made a big difference. And you say, well, that's fine. If you can live your life, that's okay. And then, but then as part of it, you say, but remember, a lot of people can become tolerant to this. And if it, you find that it doesn't work anymore, then there's, you know, that's the point where we want to take you off of it. So some people eh, can actually do very well with the eh, long-term opioids, but it's very, very hard to tell who it's going to be because other people are rapid metabolizers. So somebody's got a history of addictions and they would take that morphine and then within two weeks, they could rapidly metabolize and say, it doesn't work anymore, I need a higher dose. So pragmatically, a thing that makes a big difference is to have a thing called an opioid agreement. So it's an upfront agreement with the person about the medicine and the principle that's about improving function, not reducing pain. And if they come back in a month and say, yes, this has made a difference, I can live my life more, then fine. You know, if it's safe and it's effective and there's no side effects, that's okay. But if they come back and say it worked and it didn't need more, well, that's not part of the opioid agreement. Uh, and that's helped me a lot when I've had people that have been drug seeking that have initiated opioids on because it worked at the start, but then it didn't. So does, Doug, does that answer your question or not? Yeah, that's that's absolutely great. Thanks very much. And I suppose I've got another, I suppose kind of when you're getting people down, so you've uh, with it, if you've done an agreement with them, you're weaning them down off their long acting. Once you've got them down to kind of low dose long acting, sometimes I think when people have the difficulty of just saying stopping it. So do you sometimes convert them then to sh low dose short acting and then start to reduce down the short acting, or you try and just stop them Never. on like ten milligram BD. Uh -huh. No, I, I just never do because it's so easy to go back up again. So yes. three side effects of opioids. One is analgesia, two is sedation, and three is euphoria. Um, and what we find is that we, re we reduce people's opioids. What happens is that, that you can actually uncover a lot of like mental health. You know, so they've basically been they've been uh, sedating their own mental health issues, and then their mental yeah. health becomes more active. And that, so that's why screening for the mental health is really useful. So if I've got someone who is down, but they say, look, I just feel terrible now and I need to go on it. I'm thinking, oh, could this be depression or something like that that was almost like medicated instead? But um, I think that, so in general, I wouldn't convert. The only time I would do it maybe, Monica, is if somebody was very clear, it was a very clear opioid agreement. They said, look, I want to be off this, but again, I walk the dog, you know, or it's mm -hmm. to take it. And I mean, different people, are, but I think to, to make sure they don't end up in two tablets four times a day of 3,500 cocodamol mm -hmm. and they're back on the 24 milligrams of morphine. So I think, and, and even just explaining the conversion to people is really helpful mm -hmm. as well, because a lot of people are like, oh my God, I don't know. And then you're like, yeah, you're constipating, you're tired. And so again, that's why I said the principle is do no harm and it's a safe, effective, but it's an, it, that's why it's so hard to do a guideline on it because everyone's an individual as well. Great, thanks very much. And don't think we've got any more questions. There's no more hands up anyway. Let me move on to your next one. Thanks. Here we go. So geriatrics with a twist. Um, so two pictures, and we'll come back to these, but you can see two different stories. And my hope is this talk for us to move from one story to another story and how to get there. Um, probably the key point in this talk is that age is physiological, not chronological. Um, and there's 80 year olds that can, you know, climb mountains and there's six year olds that can't get out of their bed. And, and I think to see frailty through that, and this is the Canadian sort of frailty, clinical frailty scale. And I just find it very helpful to visualize it. And you see number one there, somebody super robust through number eight, they're bed bound and, and terminally ill. And it bed bound your end stage frailty. It's a palliative condition. You're almost thinking about anticipated care plan. And none of that's to do with their age. So I think it's, very, I find it very useful to almost see it myself. And you can almost see it as soon as they're in the waiting room where they are and how they get out of a chair. Uh, Bruce, uh, Bruce Guthrie has done uh, amazing work um, at the University of Dundee. And this is a multi-morbidity um, sort of uh, slide. And you can see that in the left, people with uh, a condition called heart failure, you can see all the other conditions that they have as well alongside it. 
and how people would know this ourselves that it's not single diseases, it's multimorbidity, especially as people get older. And what happens is that um, what I think is amazing about the NICE multimorbidity guideline is it basically says a lot of these people were excluded from trials. And this is about holistic case management instead of organ management, because there's so many organs. How do you treat them all at one time optimally and they'll interact with the medicines? And you can see the two red columns are pain and depression running through it as well. Um, so actually integrating that holistic assessment into someone's long-term plan how to do it can have a much better impact in their life. But again, this gives us a bit more freedom to move away from organ-specific management. I think for me, the thing that makes the biggest difference in geriatric medicine is continuity. Um, they've got a problem list of so many problems and it's so easy to get overwhelmed um, and actually just say, look, I'm happy to be your doctor. And uh, yes, you, you, you might not always get me, I get that, but if we can try and build in a bit of continuity, it makes a difference. Um, if they've got, if you feel overwhelmed with someone a bit like chronic pain, you can do it as a double appointment, take several visits, or even a nice thing is create a problem list as well. And often people don't remember, people uh, only remember half of what we say to them, and of that half, they forget half. And especially older people forget a lot as well because of different sensory impairments. So ask them to bring a carer because it will improve their uh, understanding and their adherence to medicines and management plans. Realistic medicine, uh, so we're moving away from, you know, what's the matter to what matters to you and, and to integrate that because a lot of their problems are chronic, they're not fixable, it's about managing it. Recognising frailty and having ACP conversations uh, if they're needed. Um, somebody's having multiple admissions or end-stage frailty or advancing cancer. And nutrition and adequate food intake is just so important and to, to really have that eye for it. Do they look healthy? Are they not healthy? Are there folic acid and B12 off? What's the protein doing? Um, Immunisation, so it's like doing the basics well, I think, uh, in care of the elderly that makes such a big difference and are they getting out? And often medication reviews, especially when the harm's present. So medicines build up in older people. They don't metabolise the same way that younger people do with kidneys and liver, and they can get more side effects. And again, I probably prescribe more AHPs than I do medicines in that regard. So from their, their you know, their eye, eye care optom optometry all the way to podiatry. So you're thinking what person can make the biggest difference here, not necessarily a drug always, um, or mostly in fact. And then recognising the wider social dynamic, carer strain and wider social work involvement. Specific conditions, again, the frailty room, uh, waiting room test, how they get out of a chair and consider a medication review, asking yourself. Falls is the big one. So postural blood pressure is huge uh, to see if there's a dip in medicines that are causing it. And effectively, medicines go from helping ha to harming people is the, is the kind of the failure they get. And then there's ICST, Integrated Care and Support Team and Falls Clinic, that's very useful. Delirium, 4AT can be a tool for assessment for that. Dementia, AMT, uh, and if it's present, we're thinking about referring on to the, uh, um, the memory clinic. Uh, depression gets missed a lot. Um, and uh, I think we're all kind of scared about asking because the, it's like they've already got three other problems and it's like you're opening Pandora's box. So geriatric depression score is very useful. Um, and it's just yes, no questions, 15 questions. So it, it, you can't move and like, oh, I've got this problem and that. You just have to answer yes or no. So it's very brief. And that will flag up um, depression, especially in an old adult, especially people in pain as well, because that's a pragmatic way to find it. And then it opens the door to uh, mental health involvement, you know, uh, management as part of the pain management or other things. And you've got your third sector, CBT, um, meds and old age psychiatry if needed. Pain, keep it simple. Um, so paracetamol and topicals, low dose paracetamol for under 50 kilograms. Um, and cardiac, uh, yes, a lot of uh, cardiac conditions happen as people get older. So have a think about AF, any heart failure, or aortic stenosis, because um, that's the one that, that kind of uh, causes people to be fatigue more, get more short of breath, chest pain, um, and maybe chest pain, and you think, oh, they've got an end stolen murmur, right? Okay, so that's something that can make a massive difference in someone's life if that's picked up so they can get their um, surgery. And UTIs, um, easily to easily over diagnose. So, really, the, the, the feedback is that they, you really need positive symptoms. A dipstick will always be positive for a bacteria, a bacteria. And um, so, you want to do MSSU or, or positive symptoms with it so you're not over treating. Legs, um, so dangly legs, big deal. Um, and so edema, pain, ulcers. So again, legs up and avoid calcium channel blockers. So a lot of these people historically had hypertension, the amylodipine, 
and uh, then we add furosemide, and you think, why don't we just take off the amylodipine? Maybe stick on endapamide if it's needed. But you know, clean up the drugs. I think it's a big message in raising the legs. Um, and the social side of things, um, uh, the family, friends, benefits, social work department, elder abuse, so that, that social dynamic as well. Um, obviously, if the leg edema is up to their knees or whatever, you're thinking heart failure, but a lot of people, it's low chronic low grade. Um, this is a whole toolkit for geriatrics right here, uh, made in conjunction with the British Geriatric Society and RCGP. And it's the Comprehensive Geriatric Assessment Primary Care, and it's different bits of it. So something maybe, if you're interested, to learn, so for example, how to create a problem list, bone health, capacity, delirium, balance issues, medication review. So it's to make it easier for GPs to do this and the kind of real world of 10 and 15 minute appointments. This is just what the geriatric depression scale looks like. As you can see, it's just like yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. So really simple to do um, and quick. Uh, Ness Polypharmacy uh, website is excellent. And um, if you go into that, uh, Frailist Adults, um, you can see that there's really good information about numbers needed to treat and side effects. And this page here is really nice and effectively it gives you permission to just kind of cut back on a uh, treatment on uh, frail people with medicines because it often causes more harm. So less control over blood pressure, blood sugars, ACR, blood thinners, heart rate control meds. So it gives us a bit more confidence to pull back and, and improve someone's quality of life. Uh, this is a beautiful table, uh, again, from the polypharmacy app. It's called the ADR table, and it's the side effects and the, are on the top. So that's falls and fractures. And then as you go down, it's all the common medicines that people are prescribed that can cause those side effects. So it's a nice kind of cheat sheet um, if you're kind of visiting someone and they've got a ton of drugs and to kind of cross-reference and make it easier to what to take off. So this is the geriatrics with a twist bit. Um, so you saw how sad this lady looked on the left and how happy she looks on the right. And the thing that got me about this is that um, on the left, what I noticed is that she's herself and she's got surrounded by pills. And on the right, there's not a pill in sight, and, uh, but she's talking to someone and, um, and it's kind of brightened up her day. And we've probably all got loved ones that are older that are like this as well. They kind of light up when they see us. Um, and it, it kind of takes us into the drivers of health and what actually improves health. And medicine's only up to a quarter, whereas social economic um, actually makes up half. So really for yield, you're thinking, you know, the social side of healthcare as well. And this is a graph that just sort of stunned me when I saw it. And this is how much time we spend alone in our life, uh, what age we are. So if we're first five, I would imagine people here are in their 30s, uh, maybe early 40s, something like that. And you can see this is saturated. The time with your partner, the time with your work colleagues, the time with your kids, the time with your friends even is, is there. And But as you get older, our patients are alone. Most of it, we're just alone. And it's just a, a kind of lens to see it through how lonely that must be. And the loneliness is the equivalent of smoking 16, 15 cigarettes a day as well. So a real risk factor. Um, and then you say, well, I've not got time for that. And that's fine, but other people do. Um, so the third sector, Age Scotland, that's got a weekly friendship line that you give someone, you just ask, are you lonely if they're coming a lot for various kind of conditions, but you think mm, there's something behind this. And they'll phone the person once a week and they'll also do a benefits assessment, make sure they're getting enough money as well so they can heat their house and get food. And it's like, and then like, there's a mental health liaison nurse and then there's a link worker as well. And then if needed, social work as well. These are the resources um, from the talk, um, and there's the GSF Prognostic Indicator Guide, really good for identifying people last year, their life as well. There's that, um, and the different tables are there. Back to you, Monica. Great, thank you very much again. Uh, yeah, that was really helpful, I think, because we do one of the, we've got one of the care homes under the LES, so I know that, like, the clinical frailty scale, actually, it's really quite helpful it was just to have the kind of conversations with relatives as well about kind of ACP and resuscitation to be like, actually, this is where your relative is in terms of frailty. So I know I've used that before. Um, and again, really good table on the, I quite like the Apollo Pharmacy ADRs because sometimes you're like, where do you start? Because you're on three things could, could all cause it, which is the best one to stop first of all. So um, very helpful. Um, and so Katzen, hi, thanks for this talk. Um, just regarding Age Scotland, um, that she'd miss picking up on that. Did you say they have a helpline where people can phone once a week? Yeah, it's a friendship line um, for, and they just phone the person once a week and they look into local amenities as well. So it's uh, 
it's really nice because they'll say, oh, this is what's in your area and we'll keep in touch with you. So it's, it's to build relationships. Thanks. Anyone else got any other questions? Hands up, chat. Again, I, think I quite like the Jade Attic question scale, score question because, as you say, you've had a 15 20 minute conversation trying to cover everything else. And then you think, actually, as you say, you're isolated. Probably your mood is a major factor here as well. And how do you start addressing that? But actually, yeah, I thought that was very kind of simple kind of screening tool to use, which is really helpful. Just give it to them, say it's 15, 20 yes. minutes, they've had three other problems, you're knackered, you've got a headache, you're not eating for hours. Just give them the table and say, yes. hand it in the reception and then we'll catch yes. up with another update. That, that deserves its own time. Yeah, definitely. Great. Don't think we've got any more questions. Well, thank you very, very much, Kieran, for three very good talks. I'm impressed that you rose to the challenge of uh, being able to kind of get those really important topics um, into 10 minutes with lots of really practical, helpful tips and uh, and resources as well. I've got another question, just somebody wants to go back to the pain chat. Is there an app for opioid conversion? I know pain data have the website, but I don't know if there's an app as well. Good question. Yeah, I don't actually know if there's an app, um, to be honest. Um, I, I, it would be nice, wouldn't it? Yeah, I think mm -hmm. I know that Ness are working on, I know I looked at the Ness Polypharmacy recently and there's more information in dependency form in medicines. Um, but the, I mean, the pain data one is really nice because it's got that conversion table in it as well. So someone's on, you know, oxy, whatever, you know, or buprenorphine or the patches and things like that. And you think, geez, where do I start? And, but again, don't do it alone. Don't be alone with this. Your practice pharmacist is a great asset. And if they don't know, they can get uh, support from the prescribing pharmacist team as well. And then sometimes even like doing an advice letter to the pain team and having that consistent message as well that they can say, yeah, we agree. There's no evidence for this long-term morphine. This is how we would do it. Or you get support. So you're giving a consistent message to the patient as well, especially if they're a bit hesitant. Great, thanks. I hear people saying thank you, Kieran, finding it very useful. So thank you very much for that. Um, and apologies, um, I have had kind of, I know Kieran mentioned as well, that we will be sending around the presentations um, along with the feedback form. So um, all the helpful resources and the hyperlinks um, will be sending around so you'll be able to have a look at. And yeah, and I'll be watching the um, quite a lot of those pain videos. That's on my appraisal this year. Chronic pain, try to get to grips with it. So yeah, this has been really helpful. All right, well, thank you very much, Kieran. Uh, and so Shand is going to speak to us about sustainability. Um, so again, some format, so she'll kind of speak into us and there's a chance for questions at the end. Um, Thanks, so Monica. You, can everyone see that? Okay. Yes, can. Thanks. Fab. Um, thanks so much for having me. So my name is Shan Ashby. I am also a first five GP, um, but now nearing the end. I'm in my fifth year, somewhat unbelievably, um, and I chair the local Greener Practice Glasgow group. And some of you might have heard of Greener Practice, some of you might not. Um, it's for GPs and other people working in primary care who are interested in um, well, environmentally sustainable primary care and making links between climate change and health and trying to reduce the carbon footprint of, of primary care. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today and, and trying to give you some top tips in 10. Although I found it very difficult squeezing to 10, so apologies, I'm going to really rattle through this, but hopefully I'll be able to um, signpost to some resources so you can look stuff up in your own time. Um, yeah, so obviously this is in the context of um, the climate and ecological emergency that we're in at the moment, and I'm not going to talk too much about climate change and the science, I think we're all aware um, of that. But we have had over one degree of warming since pre-industrial times, and um, that's due to greenhouse gas emissions, of course. Unfortunately, global greenhouse gas emissions continue to rise, and um, global warming continues to, yeah, to increase at an unprecedented rate. So um, we're in a pretty dire situation, as I'm sure most of you are aware. And um, of course, this is tied to health because we rely on our, our planet for all of our basic needs. So our food, water and um, shelter and, and climate change is threatening all of that. Um, so it's so important that we um, tackle it. Um, so this photo is from Pakistan. 
uh, this year and I think you're probably all aware that Pakistan um, had really really high temperatures over 50 degrees and then had drought and then had that horrendous flood covering two-thirds of the country and just the uh, sheer scale of of destruction and um the effect on on human life there it's just it's pretty unimaginable um and i've also put this slide here just to remind me to talk about a bit about climate justice and the fact that unfortunately many of the people who are suffering the most effects of climate change are some of the most vulnerable and the poorest in the world um, and also those who've contributed the least to the problem so there's a huge just injustice issue here um, what I don't want um, this talk to make you do is just ah, uh, despair and hide under your bed which I think is what a lot of people want to do when they hear about climate change because it's just so overwhelming um, but what we need to do is, is come together and start taking action and I think by taking action and by making changes in our day-to-day -day life it does help to ease some of that anxiety and to help you feel like you're moving forward. Um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is a group of scientists who publish every few years information on, on climate change, where we are and what we need to do. And so I'd recommend having a read of, of these documents if um, you'd like to learn more about the science. But what I wanted to draw your attention to was this um, quote by the chair who said, uh, we are at a crossroads and the decisions we make now can secure a livable future but we really do start need to start making significant changes to how we live our lives um, at every level so personal professional of course political um so yes um we need to start making those changes and this slide is to um to draw attention to the opportunities that are there if we can make this take the steps um to mitigate climate change i don't want to focus on all the doom and gloom actually if we can um, take action and improve our green spaces, improve our active travel connections so people are walking and cycling more, um, improve our diets so we're eating healthier, more plant-based diets, that has huge public health benefits as well as reducing carbon emissions and air pollution. So there's, there's massive um, opportunity here for us to actually improve public health if we can um, get this right. So I said already that we um, we all know that we need to make changes in our personal and our professional lives. Um, and I would argue that as GPs and as, as healthcare workers, we're actually in a really good place to lead on this. Um, we are trusted by the public, despite recent media attacks. I think healthcare professionals are, are generally, um, they are trusted and um, we see a lot of patients, we have a lot of access to, to the public. Um, so in that role, we can be leaders and, and, um, and share the message that this is important to us, it's important to all of society to make these changes. Um, it's also, there's good evidence that when people are thinking of, that health is actually quite a good big priority for people and it can be quite a good angle um, to take, to try and um, encourage people to take action on climate change. Um, it's actually more powerful in economics and things, economic arguments. And um, so uh, again, we're in a good position to, to talk about this. I would argue that this is this is a duty, this is one of the, the GMC duties of a doctor. Actually, there's such a public health risk um, from climate change that you know is that's our professional duty to be acting and to be talking about this. Um, also, professionally, we have a really significant carbon footprint and a much bigger carbon footprint than we probably have in our personal lives because of the number of um, medicines that we're prescribing and the carbon footprint associated with, with those. So that's what I'm gonna talk about in a bit more detail now. Um, so the NHS is responsible for about 5% of the UK carbon footprint. And within that primary care is about 25%. And um, so if you look at the primary care column here, sorry, it's quite small, but hopefully you can see um, the main sort of hotspots are Energy and um, metered dose inhalers is, is a big hotspot just itself. And then medicines and chemicals is the biggest equipment and then travel. So they are the main areas that are the main carbon uh, hotspots of, of primary care. 
So in terms of where to start, I think it's, it's obviously relevant that we know that, but it's also really important to, to think about what interests your team and how you can get your um, practice on board. Because it is, it's, um, I think it's really important that we're motivating each other and that we're taking action. It doesn't always, it doesn't really matter where you start as long as you're making a start and you're getting people on board and then that can build a bit of momentum. Um, but in terms of how I'm going to break it up today, I'm going to break it up into four main categories of, in terms of the hotspots. So respiratory care, prescribing, energy use and travel and try and give you some top tips in each of those categories. I'm going to just do a bit more background on respiratory care. I think most of you will be aware of this, but just in case you're not. So um, the reason that uh, respiratory care and, meter dose and inhalers have such a huge carbon footprint is because metered dose inhalers contain a propellant that is a really potent greenhouse gas, so thousands of times more potent than carbon dioxide. Um, so if you, that that's like the propellant that squishes out the medicine when you push the button. Um, and if you look at something like a Ventolin um, meter dose inhaler, it has a, a carbon footprint of, of equivalent to 28 kilograms um, of carbon dioxide, which is equivalent to 175 miles driving in a, a car. Whereas a dry powder inhaler, which doesn't contain the propellant, which is activated just by the sharp inspiratory breath, has a much, much lower carbon footprint. And it's interesting, in this country, we prescribe a lot of metered dose inhalers compared to other European countries. I think approximately 70% of our inhalers are metered dose inhalers, whereas other parts of Europe is much lower, um, especially Scandinavia, it's more like 10%. Um, and for most of our patients, a dry powder inhaler is, is just, just as appropriate. And actually for many patients, it's preferable because um, doesn't require a spacer and it, they mostly have dose counters which are really handy for patients um, and the sort of style of, of in-breath required that short and sharp inhale is often what patients will do anyway with the meter dose inhaler when it's not actually appropriate for the meter dose inhaler does that make sense with the meter dose inhaler um, you're supposed to do the sort of slow and steady breath in whereas I think most of our patients are, are using a, a inhalation that's more appropriate for a dry powder inhaler. Um, so dry powder inhaler is not appropriate for everybody, for um, really young patients or for um, people with poor respiratory effort. A meter dose inhaler is much more appropriate, but that would be with a spacer. Anyway, um, that's the crux of um, the issue with inhalers. Let, I'm just gonna show you this, um, inhaler device guide, which is the new um, GGC inhaler device guide. Um, and I worked alongside some pharmacists. Um, well, I helped a little bit in, in producing this. And um, the, the main thing you'll see along the right is the traffic light system beside each of the inhalers. So green is low carbon footprint, um, amber is, is high, and then red is very high. And so you'll see that the dry powder inhaler, so the salbutamol easy inhaler, in this particular um, chart um, is above the uh, meter dose inhaler, their joint first line, but I think it still makes a difference. So hopefully people will be starting to prescribe dry powder inhalers um, first for um, whoever it's clinically appropriate for. Um, the other thing that changed on this inhaler um, device guide, which is just a it seems like a tiny change, but actually it makes a big difference is if you are gonna use a meter dose inhaler, um, looking at something like clenol, rather than prescribing uh, two puffs of 100 micrograms clenol twice a day, prescribing one puff of 200 micrograms clenol twice a day, actually it's halving the number of puffs and that's halving the amount of propellant and halving the carbon footprint. So it's much more significant than you might think. And uh, similarly, the, if you are going to prescribe a metered dose inhaler, some of them have much higher carbon footprints than others. So if you look at something like a Ventolin metered dose inhaler, uh, that has a much higher propellant volume than um, a salamol. So because it's got a higher volume, it's got a higher carbon footprint. So you're better off choosing something like a salamol if you're going to prescribe a um, salbutamol meter dose inhaler. Um, so that's a lot of information. And what I want to really signpost you to is the Greener Practice um, High Quality and Low Carbon Asthma care toolkit which has got loads of information on it lots of educational videos and loads of quality improvement projects and they're broken into four main areas so diagnosis disease device and disposal 
So the diagnosis one is basically about improving the diagnosis of asthma, making sure we're, we're diagnosing it um, and coding it appropriately. Disease is all about targeting um, those patients who are have poorly controlled disease and who generally tend to be overusing their SABAs, um, so their salbutamols, and um, we know that that correlates with poor clinical outcomes as well as having a high carbon footprint. Device is about offering those lower carbon options when, when it's possible, so dry powder inhalers if possible, um, and disposal is all about taking the, the um, inhalers back to a pharmacy because we know that if they're put into landfill, um, the greenhouse gases might go up into the atmosphere, whereas if you can take them to the pharmacy, they're actually incinerated at the moment. Hopefully in the future, they'll be recycled. Um, so have a look at this toolkit. It's fantastic, really, really helpful um, stuff on there. Um, again, if you're in GGC, there's a couple of other resources available um, through the respiratory MCN. So there are some posters that you can put up in your waiting room for disposal and there's a whole um, toolkit on there that takes you through in more detail, but it's similar to the greener practice one, so using either of them. So just to um, reiterate my top tips for respiratory care, good clinical care is low carbon care. So you want patients well controlled basically and on an, on an inhaler that suits them that they can use. That's the most important thing. Um, exploring the Greener Practice Asthma Toolkit in your own time is a really good idea. It's a fantastic educational resource. Um, educating your team and making sure those inhaler device charts are accessible and are in each room so that people know what the alternatives are to their usual clenal and um, ventolin. Um, starting new patients on dry powder inhalers, um, for the vast majority, it's clinically appropriate for, for them. And as I said before, if a metered dose inhaler is required, then using the lower carbon option, so a salamol over a ventolin, um, and encouraging safe disposal. I think probably the most important thing is getting practice nurses on board because they do so much of this work and so many of the inhaler reviews. Um, so yeah, making sure your team is on board with it. Prescribing top tips, there's loads of overlap with what kieran has been talking about in terms of frailty and deprescribing. Um, it's all about realistic medicine. Um, using your links workers, using social prescribing and reducing polypharmacy. And um, there's a new sort of frailty and polypharmacy guideline in GDC, which I've linked to um, there, which I thought was quite useful. Um, so choosing the least environmentally toxic medications. I think that's something that we don't think about as much where, our, where the medication goes and it all goes into our water. Um, and we don't have very good processing for getting rid of these medications. And that we, is proven to affect fish and things and could have some human health impacts as well. So um, there's, I've linked to a presentation about this because it's way too much information for me to talk through just now, but a few top tips would be um, if you're gonna choose an SSRI, um, obviously you wanna think about all the clinical reasons, but environmental toxicity wise, uh, it's um, sertraline, which is the least environmentally toxic. And then um, in terms of your NSAIDs, um, diclofenac is really bad. So that's really environmentally toxic. And that would be gels and things as well as your oral. Um, so there are two that I came away from that presentation with. Um, encouraging people to take medicines back to pharmacies so they're not throwing them out and definitely not flushing them down the toilet. People think, I think they're doing the right thing by flushing them down the toilet, but that's just going straight into um, our water. So energy use really quickly, obviously switching off all equipment at the end of the day and getting someone to check uh, like a rota can be quite useful. Um, low energy lighting, so LED lighting, getting a green energy supplier is key. And of course, things like insulation are really important for reducing energy use and can be money saving longer term. There's good loans and grants available from Business Energy Scotland. Um, so I would really recommend you have a look at that website to see if any of it's, um, it, it is, it's really useful for GP practices. Um, travel top tips would be making sure your surgery is basically accessible by bike and by foot. So improving bike storage facilities, um, sometimes storing brollies in the practice for like, I mean, for staff members who are walking can be quite a nice thing to do. A bit of friendly competition is quite fun among staff as well. And Sustrans and Love to Ride have um, cycling sort of like workplace challenges. And then Walk the World is quite good as well. If you want to get people in your practice walking, you can do walking challenges together. 
and that again there's some grants and loans from cycling.scot um, they do bike storage um, loans and then energy saving trust has some like e-cars and e-bike loans um so almost there um i think it's really important that we're using our voice as healthcare professionals and, and when it's appropriate in consultations and um, trying to you know talk about this recommend plant-based diets encourage active travel encouraging exercise of course um, and if you can use the space that's available, so using the waiting room, social media and newsletters to, to talk about this, to encourage um, safe medicines, like returning medications to pharmacies, inhalers to pharmacies, that sort of thing. And um, also speaking to politicians and, and councillors and as, a health, as health professionals, we do have a voice and we are listened to in that regard. So I would encourage you to do that. Um, tips in terms of more learning because there's just so much um to cover that i haven't had a chance to just now and um, the green impact health toolkit is a really useful uh, like online toolkit for gp practices and there's loads of quality improvement projects and you can sign up your practice for free and um, so have a look at that the ecomedics podcast is great if you want if you enjoy podcast i love just so easy to turn it on and just listen and absorb so that's a great one and then greener practice website is really useful and that's where the asthma a toolkit is and my final tip would be find your clan and um, try and get a team your team at the practice um, to work together on this and also you can work with other GPs and greener practice is um, is one way that you can connect with other people in primary care who are, who are trying to uh, do this work and yeah we'd, we'd love to have any Anyone who wants to come along to our meetings and join us doing this work would be brilliant. Um, so I've just put some um, links to some of the resources that I've shared and my email's at the bottom. So um, you're welcome to email if, if you want to come along to any of our meetings. Um, yeah, so thanks. And any questions? And I'm sorry I overran a bit. No, that's great. Stan, thank you very much. I know it's important. How do you discuss sustainability climate change in 10 minutes? <laughs> so thank you very, very, very much. That was excellent. Um, I think even like the most one was that the picture of the cars, the two inhalers, the DPI and MDI, like that's I think if you've got somebody who's so like visual, like yeah. gosh, that's such a difference. I think how many of those prescriptions you sign every day. Mm, like, yeah, yeah. Like uh, you know, it's just it's it's a lot. It's, Massive amount, yes, yeah, so when you add up. So I think if you get somebody who's kind of, and, oh, they just they prefer their MDI, I should show them that picture. Yeah. That and the for. thing is, I mean, for a lot of those patients, it, it's actually a lot of salbutamol that you're prescribing and they're actually not well-controlled asthmatics. So mm -hmm. it's not just about reducing the carbon footprint. It's actually about improving the clinical care. And I think a lot of them, yeah, there's a lot of room for improvement in terms of our asthma care in this country and this is an opportunity for us to improve asthma care whilst um, reducing the carbon footprint so I would really stress that it's, it's about improving clinical care as, as well as reducing the carbon footprint um, and yeah. yeah so there's, and I would really recommend the greener practice um, toolkit and there's way more information on that and, and it, it really focuses on good asthma care as well as the carbon footprint excellent Good, thank you very much. And Kira's got a question. Oh, you're still on mute, Kira. I'm going to mute myself, number one error. Uh, hi, Shan. Um, yes, I I prescribed someone Ventolin about four hours ago and felt so guilty. Um, and the only reason, but I wrote on it, you need to come for an asthma review as well, because they, they had it was poor care and they hadn't yeah. come and they're just doing acute. So, completely yeah. fits into what you're saying. It, one of the things I've thought with this topic before is that um, I think if we could press a button and make it happen, we all would. It's that when you've got so many other buttons that are flashing at the same time, but one of the things is how to make it easier and listening to your talk and that graphic, the two cars, uh, you know, it, it's hard not to be convinced. You know, we're already convinced, but how... I suppose it's how to make it easy for it to move forward. And yeah. one of the things for me was, and I don't know if this is feasible or not, but is there anyone in the kind of climate movement, the doctors that can do talks at practice level or anything like that, almost like as a CPD? Because I think you do need to do it as a whole practice. And if you're a lone voice, 
with a lot of people would lack the confidence maybe to bring it up at a practice meeting because so-and-so would never agree sort of thing. But if there was some way of actually saying, well, there's a CPD event, they can come to us at lunchtime or something like that and actually do practical ways and how it's done and the difference it makes. Is that anything that's feasible or yeah. not? I mean, definitely there have been some CPD events going on. I know that Janie and um, the, the pharmacist that I, in the respiratory MCN who worked on the inhaler guide um, have been doing lots of CPD events and I think they'd be happy to do that at practices. Um, they did they did a grand rounds um, they did like various um meetings like educational events but I guess it's hard to reach everybody um and what was I going to say I think this this will be coming more and more because it's coming from government level um there's a new um respiratory guideline coming out and there's um targets to reduce our MDI prescribing significantly I can't remember the exact percentage but it's but it's really quite um significant so we'll need to have much more education um on this and and i think you're right it's important that we get this right and what we don't want is people sort of they don't have enough time so then they're like blanket switching and it's it's done dangerously we really want to do it safely and in a way that is optimizing clinical care um but i would say that the greener practice um toolkit has got loads of educational resources so even you could sit down at the practice and like, you know, watch them um, and it would only take like half an hour or something. And it's like really informative. Um, or I'm sure that if it was a bigger thing, the the respiratory MCN pharmacist would be happy to um, do some more education. Um, that's probably the, the best people to be teaching on this in uh, GGC. Um, but yeah, I think it's coming and, and hopefully there'll be more and more education on it. Excellent, thanks. Is there any more questions? And I think it's, you just, I like your, yeah, find your con, because I think that is it, as Kieran was saying as well, uh, actually taking on to do it yourself, it's just when you have the yeah. time when it's so busy. So I think it is, it's actually it's getting the whole practice and, and have like a whole practice like, meeting to discuss it. That's it, and I think, um, you know, day to day at work, you just and I feel the same. You just feel completely like bombarded. You try to get through the day, but then when you look at where we are in terms of our planet, like it's not. Um, you know, we just we need to do it, and we need to do it quickly. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, what future do our children have? And I think so. When you look at it like that, you're like, all oh, right, yeah, of course. But it day to day, it's finding the the actual time and. I think getting the practice on board is really important and the practices where where um I've seen them make make good strides in this it's really been a team approach and like a few of the partners have, have made it a priority and they've discussed it at each clinical meeting and you know it, it's been something that has had sustained focus and they've made good strides um I know um Peter Costin's practice in Cars um in drum chapels done lots of stuff and they're doing lots of projects ongoing and so there are a few practices leading um the way and um, but hopefully it'll, it'll get out to everybody in time yep. yeah kieran have they written up like a kind of case study or like a top tips um the i don't know i can ask him um they've written a few bits up they're still doing the biggest projects i think are just sort of starting now um but they they have shared some top tips um because i mean most of the stuff is is having the um inhaler guides like really accessible for people and getting practice nurses on board because they're the ones who are doing all the, the reviews um but yeah, they have shared a few bits. Um, I'm sure Peter will do more presenting, but it's, again, it's just finding the time to, yeah, I think it's just, it's getting moving now. So hopefully there'll be more and more coming. Yeah, definitely. And it's even, I think, um, PPP for PBSGL. So there's even a oh, PBSGL oh, just released a module. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. actually, thanks for uh, highlighting that, Monica, there is a PBSGL on sustainable healthcare now. Um, so that's brilliant. Yep, for example, the focus on primary care. So we were doing that one in January. So I thought that's good. We're going to start the new year. How can we, how can we adapt to these changes into practice? So 
Great. Well, thank you both very much. Um, I hope that people all enjoy that. I know I did. Um, I know I've learned a lot from tonight. And um, I see the kind of purpose of tonight was not learning absolutely everything we can about sustainable because we're not going to our, our chronic pain, but actually exactly this, the top tips and actually the practical resources, what can we do day to day in our practice um, to change. So but thank you both very much, Kieran and Shan. I'm amazed at how the, the talks were fantastic um, and how much you were able to cover it in such a short space of time. So thank you both very much. Um, I think somebody in the chat had asked about the recording. I'll let Kirsty ask that. Can I Chris answer that question because that's a technical question. Um, but I just want to say thank you all very much for joining us tonight. Um, and yeah, we will be sending around the slides with the feedback. Um, and thank you very much as well to Kirsty and Jillian, who are the events team again for um, RCGP for helping to organise tonight. So thank you.